Hi, this is Dr. Liz Owen. Join me at the Edge of AI to explore the intersection of games, cognitive, and data sciences together on the podcast where we blend AI and creativity with culture. Keep listening. Hello, AI podcast passengers. Jump on in. Here's what's to come on today's journey. Find out the future of digital immersion from games to learning software, unraveling the role of adaptive systems from AI to machine learning and back, the intricate world of detecting hard to measure human behaviors like productive failure and cognitive engagement with AI. And why our guests think that change is what makes every moment in your life precious. All this and more, take your seat. Welcome aboard the Edge of AI podcast. Snap into your safety belt and prepare to explore the depths of the rapidly expanding AI universe. Each episode is a dispatch featuring hyper-relevant reports from the pilots, pioneers, and passengers aboard the AI rocket ship. We explore the latest use cases and developments in AI, hear from experts building tech, and learn how this disruptive force is transforming industries and society. Hello, I'm Ron Levy, and I'll be your captain today on today's voyage to the edge of AI. Just like most of you, I've embraced the spirit of exploration and entrepreneurship throughout my whole life, from starting my own business before graduating high school to traversing the world's most challenging terrains. I've always sought out new frontiers and adventures. I built one of the largest award-winning custom home companies in Los Angeles. Most recently, I've navigated complex regulations while founding and leading a public company that is dedicated to applying technology and training. Buckle up and get ready. Let's tackle uncharted territories in AI today with curiosity as our guiding star. So today's episode, we have Dr. Elizabeth, Elizabeth uh, Owen, and she's the uh, founder of Learning Data Discovery and Thrival Interactive. Liz is a behavioral uh, learning sciences veteran, a data science leader, and an adaptive media designer. With over a decade at the forefront of AI games and cognition, she's helped create AI-driven games and immersive tech for a positive impact at Google, EA Games, and the U.S. Department of Education. But that's not all. She has also worked alongside GLS, Metacog, Glass Lab Games, Zynga, ETS, and Age of Learning. Learning Data Discovery is a consultancy that integrates technology, data science, and cognition for positive impact in games and immersive media. They worked with Google, Nickelodeon, Epic Games, Spry Fox, we might say Netflix there too, with Spry Fox and the National Science Foundation. Thrival Interactive is an emerging AI-driven game studio defining the future of engaged play. Dr. Elizabeth, we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much, Ron. It's a pleasure to, to join the show. Fantastic. Well, we're excited to have a conversation today with a learning sciences expert given the rapidly shifting landscape for education thanks to AI. And um, how has the science of learning evolved over the past several decades? So that's that's a very relevant question uh, in terms of traditional learning environments and digital learning environments and environments like simulations and games. Uh, surprisingly relevant there too. So quick background, learning sciences is a discipline that combines psychology, takes a lot of um, cues from cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, and educational psychology, as well as computer science and neuroscience. And it pulls those things together to help understand how people learn and in what contexts and how to optimize that through technology. Um, this field, uh, that's part of my PhD was in learning sciences. Um, I had focused on uh, data science in digital environments um, like games and simulations uh, and applications of, of learning science within that to understand um, in real time, what are hard to measure behaviors and ways of thinking that we can pick up in real time using data science? Um, so things like um, productive failure and things like cognitive engagement and understanding that in real time, um, you know, affect, you know, uh, identifying whether someone's bored or 
frustrated or, you know, that kind of thing to really pick up on those things to support um, a personalized experience. And this is applicable to learning software as well as games. Um, so this is this is an emphasis of mine um, in, in the PhD and, and beyond. Um, I think the consultancy I have learning data discovery is very focused on this intersection of learning and cognitive science with immersive media and AI to support positive change, as you said, uh, because the learning sciences field has moved into, um, you know, data driven technology in particular uh, in the last probably 10 years. Uh, I've seen this really accelerate in the last 10 years. Um, data science became uh, very prominent in the learning sciences starting in the 2010, 2012, and has really accelerated from there with the emergence of uh, disciplines like learning analytics, um, educational data mining, as well as a field of learning engineering, which combines um, learning science um, and computer science and building of things uh, with data science. So it's sort of well, like- Exactly. I mean, if I take the foundation of your studies, your expertise and what you've learned, it would have been to uh, to get gain expertise there would have been applicable over the last hundred years, right? That that's just the learning science and foundation. And uh, the reason I bring it up that way is the next thing we have is technology, right? And as you just said, since about 2010, mm -hmm. um, computer power, maybe software programs, yeah. maybe development enabled yeah. a whole different way of addressing what was relevant for a hundred years. So if we look at AI and adaptive learning mm -hmm. and the impact. Uh, for knowledge retention, but mm. in conjunction with the desire of individuals to learn. So you've got the knowledge retention and the desire. Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. So I think sort of personalized learning through uh, data-driven technology is something that has really become much more prominent in the last 10 years, fueled by, by AI and data. Um, so I think that the our ability to provide personalized learning which means um, at any given moment um, a person interacting with the software their needs are detected and responded to in real time um, that's something very powerful that we've you know relatively only recently been able to um, to move forward uh, my specialization has been in high polish um, games for the commercial market that also supports this kind of intensified personalization, not just for learning, but for play performance um, and general sort of cognitive growth. And uh, it's it's really interesting to see this expand. Um, you know, in general, intelligent systems offer uh, and support and a review of content as needed and tailored to the user or the learner or the player however it's applicable. And there's a lot of learning science behind that. So, you know, just scaffolding of information, which means that you have just in time information about what you need to do next. Or um, if you're struggling, for example, in a cognitive tutoring system, if you're struggling on a math problem, the system can detect, oh, this is where you're struggling. Let me give you a hint about that. Or let me give you some support here. That's called, uh, Jim G is a huge, a huge founder of the sort of games and learning field wrote an, some amazing stuff about how principles of good learning are games. So for example, um, this sort of just-in-time information is something commercial games feature all the time. So a good game will offer you a well-ordered series of problems with just-in-time information to support performance and growth in which the player has roles, goals, and agency. An important feature there is also low cost of failure, which is one reason that games are such an amazing learning vehicle. Um, even completely commercial games, you will find there is a low cost of failure because in general, there are some games that are not, we can get into that. When failure is a means of discovering an underlying rule system uh, and, and, and exploring boundaries and then developing strategies based on your discovery, that is a really exciting part of play for most people. And it's also an exciting part of learning. <laughs> so like when you're learn to walk, right? You don't just sort of try to take your first step and fall and then just give up, right? Like, like oh, <laughs> that one's not a walker. You know, like we, we don't do that, right? You, you like, you learn, okay, well that didn't work because 
I'm, I toppled over here. Like I didn't, you know, so let me try again. And you get up and you try again and it's learning through failure. And essentially that's how games operate. Uh, and they make it fun and it's a low cost of failure and it's a very natural way of learning as well. Anyway, I'm we, sorry to interrupt. So you were, you no, were no, it was good. It was good. And, and, and it is why the term gamification, I hear it all the time now in business. Let's gamify this, let's gamify that. Mm. That wasn't the case a few years back. So yeah. What yeah. You just described very eloquently is the reason for all that. And, you know, the original question had to do with knowledge retention yeah. and the desire for individuals to learn. Mm -hmm. You, you just with what you just described it's just exactly right it keeps people engaged and it keeps them learning mm -hmm. but let's let's break down the concept of agent-based instructional learning and mm -hmm. you know what is it and how is this related to the work that you do yeah great question so agent-based instruction um or it's also called agent-based modeling is essentially a way of understanding a problem Let's go, actually, let's back up. Let's say just agent-based instruction um, is a way of teaching someone something in a digital space where there is a character that serves, a, a digital character, an AI character that serves as a teacher or a mentor or someone supporting you in your learning journey. Uh, it can even be a character that is somebody you teach the material yourself. That's also, it's called the teachable agent. Um, and that's that's a really interesting premise uh, in terms of personalized learning. So you have something there that facilitates um, a lesson or facilitate, you know, in a very traditional sense, we're looking at very strict old school <laughs> learning environments. Um, this this avatar or character or agent is what they, they call it um, in the field. It's you know, it can help support your learning. Like, okay, now we're going to do this. And now we're going to do that. Do you need help here? Um, traditionally, it's been very simple and rule-based, uh, programmed with rule-based uh, instructional cues. And it's not super, super smart necessarily. It's just sort of a very predictable kind of character that a person can interact with. For example, agent-based modeling is related. Uh, it's used in fields like epidemiology, where they try to model how fast something, a disease will spread based on a simulation with people in a, a certain distance from each other with a certain level of, you know, um, contagiousness, that's a term. So really it's just um, characters usually representing people in a space uh, where researchers are trying to measure or understand something. With instruction, it, it has to do with, um, you know, an instructor or a mentor or even someone you're teaching. Um, in I was going to say, there's a, you know, it's always been known that the best way to learn is to teach, right? Teach what you just learned. Yes, right? yes, absolutely. That a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is so relevant. I think it's interesting to talk about. It, it may feel like a niche area, and it, it sort of is. However, I think this in particular will, is blowing up right now the potential for personalized learning through sort of agent-based instruction um, is blowing up because of generative AI. So generative AI can potentially fuel this sort of incredibly personalized, adaptive mentor in real time um, that, that gives us a, a, an unprecedented level of support and scaffolding and personalization. This also very much applies to games. So there's a, there's a movement now um, you know, to support the use of generative AI in games to make NPCs or non-player characters. Basically, an NPC in a game is a character that the, the player does not control. So it's, you know, someone you might interact with in the game. Um, in a single player game, it's not, it, it's just a uh, part of the programming. It's not a real person. But it's a character that your character, your avatar can talk to and interface with. Um, Non-player characters. I, I just want to interject because yeah. I, I, want, I want to point out that you know we could do a full full podcast on education and the science of right. This podcast is about AI, and I think what what your what the bigger point that's here is to take something as foundational as, as the learning science that's been around forever, and applying this new technology. It's kind of analogous to almost everything we've ever known, right? <laughs> It's the, the AI is a new tool yeah. that you take your expertise, add it onto it, and look what you have. And I, I just want to point it out that that's that's really what we're talking about here. I mean, it's uh, you know, I don't know what's AI's impact on cogn cognitive learning shift, right? I mean, 
changing and, and on any age group. Is, is there any conversation yeah. there? Yeah, agent, agent based instruction is actually really important for um, early learners where research kind of shows um, that if you have a, a character on screen that's talking to like a younger child, like a like pre-K to grade two child, that the child responds much more intently and with more focus rather than a disembodied voice coming from the side of the screen saying like, click on the button now. If there's a character that's like, hi, I'm blah, blah, blah. Like, can you click on the button to help me out? The kid is much more engaged and ready to ready to do it. I mean, I think it's really relevant for that age group. Again, I'll go, I'll circle back to also this being relevant in almost every age group in, in multiple spheres, not just learning, but also games. I mean, so like when you think about um, these engaged characters that are immersive because they're almost lifelike. I mean, it's, it's a bit scary in some ways and exciting to think about th that you could interact with a character in a game or a simulation or what have you, and not really be able to tell the difference between that character and interacting with a real human. Um, and well, that is- Well, I, I guess I'm gonna hit on this a little bit. You know, people have a lot of fear about AI and how it's going yes. to change things. We should talk about negative impact. You know, when you're a child and you're learning from a, an AI tutor that looks like a real person or a real character to you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it has to, have some developmental effect, no? I think, and the, I think we have a responsibility, as we always have, to um, design media uh, for responsibly for young children and children even through the age of twelve, um, with full disclosure. So, for example, the the thing on the screen might be like you know a talking pink bunny, where it's like okay. Usually a child who's in kindergarten or above can distinguish that that talking pink bunny isn't necessarily a real thing, that we know it's a character and it's sort of suspension of disbelief and that way we're interacting. I think it brings up a really good point. Um, on the flip side, I think there's, there's an adult commercial market for games that wants that, that craves that kind of thing where it's like, you know, it, so I've spent my career, as I mentioned, um, at the intersection of behavioral science, AI and games. Um, I've totally focused on high polish commercial games fueled by, by AI for personalized experience. And what I've seen is people, uh, people love the uh, game genres like, like role-playing games, RPGs, it, because it simulates an environment with controlled factors. You know, there's a, there's a rule system. They know that certain things aren't going to be um, violated, that it's very consistent in some ways. I mean, I think that's what draws people to games. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of constraints where, you know, there's a basic rule system that's kind of going to be there no matter what, which is not the case with life. Right. So there's a sense of sort of safety, but exploration within those constraints where people do want this very lifelike, um, interaction and experience with, with characters. And, um, I think it unlocks a, a lot of really amazing, um, potential for a lifelike experience. Now, the challenge there is generative AI is notoriously difficult to put reins on. So there are a couple of, a couple of, uh, you know, factors with that, which is, you know, whatever the generative AI is trained on, it uses that data to then generate new information. So it, it really only is, is as good as what data it's been trained on. Um, it, 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 so you know, putting constraints on training data is one way to deal with it, although that's difficult given the scope of, of generative AI at this point. The other way to address that is to, when you are prompting a generative AI to respond, like if you think about chat GPT, if you're entering something in there, you can prompt it to say, respond as um, a nice person who is thirsty and wants some water and is standing on a street corner. <laughs> You know, you can kind well, of free, they, you know, like, prompters is, is now a career. I mean, you can go to yeah. LinkedIn and look for jobs for being yeah. an expert prompter. And yeah, and, and don't think you can just sign up and be that person. It, it is an expertise. Yeah. It's growing and growing. And yes. You have to keep up with the ever changing yes. thing. Can, yes. can you share some examples of how you've helped your clients to use AI to adapt in you know, real time to individual behaviors and create well, a more personalized experience? Yeah. I mean, I think um, 
AI in many forms is powerful, especially paired with, with machine learning. So one thing we haven't quite talked about in detail or we didn't hit on too much is um, one specialization of mine is detection of hard to measure behaviors um, in real time to support personalized learning. So if you can measure things in real time, like productive failure versus rage quit failure, how do you know failure is bad or good when failure is so essentially a part of a learning experience and failing forward is, is important in, in many ways, especially when we're naturally learning as a child. Um, how do you know then in a, in a, in a software environment or a digital environment, what kind of failure is good and what kind of failure is bad? and frustrating. And so distinguishing between that and real time and being able to tease that out is something I've done um, over in several contexts over the years, including, um, you know, using that to fuel an adaptive system at age of learning, for example, where I was um, director of learning and data science, um, product owner of the analytics platform for the adaptive system. Um, in one of the first completely game based adaptive systems to teach mathematics to early early childhood learners. That was one example. I mean, we had over 200 games and, and the whole the whole thing was a game-based uh, experience. It wasn't like, okay, I'm gonna give you a lesson and you have to answer these questions and then you can play a game. No, the entire thing was games. Um, and it was adaptive in real time to what students needed. And that was an amazing experience. And I'm so grateful for Asian Learning for, for, for providing that sort of game-based adaptive experience and the opportunity to lead that, but, that product on the analytics end was amazing. It just, it just dawned on me that, you know, you talk about failing forward a couple of times and how healthy yeah. it is really yes. to number one, be able to do that. Number two, be in an environment where you can do that. And it just struck me that AI also fails forward. AI has yes. flaws and then you correct them, right? And it, yes. Yes. I mean, even uh, when OpenAI was developing chat GPT, um, they needed to train the model with human input. So um, they use reinforcement learning basically to have people who evaluated what, what the output was and essentially said, no, this is not right. Or yes, this is right. Um, I think that was probably mostly in terms of syntax and, 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 mm -hmm. and diction and things like that, but maybe also factual. But OpenAI needed training by humans, right? That's so true. Um, yeah, definitely. AI absolutely does feel forward. So some different, um, some different places that I've, I've used sort of this detection of hard to measure constructs to fuel an AI driven adaptive system is, uh, at age of learning, as I mentioned, um, EA and Zynga. I also worked on, um, commercial games like Sim City and Words with Friends and Plants vs. Zombies. That was PopCap, actually. Um, and I worked with them to make an educational mod of the game and detect in real time, you know, how much people were learning. So that was a really interesting sort of um, experience. And let's see what else. Oh, I, I had also worked with Google Stadia on a data driven adaptive engine. Um, I don't know how much I'm supposed to say about that. <laughs> so I'll just stop there. Um, Nickelodeon is also a place that I worked with a completely game based platform that's adaptive to kids. Uh, and um, Squirrel AI uh, in China. There was a when you mentioned really... when you mentioned uh, um, words with friends. Yeah. I think I put that in the category of the first viral game to the masses to non gamers. And yeah. Masses, right? Yes. Really Very accessible. Yeah. Yeah. I actually worked over at Zynga with the designers to mod it to support. Um, the acquisition of more academic language um, for kids playing the game. And that was a really interesting experience. Uh, you know, I'll just step back and say that data infrastructure has been a very important theme of my work across sort of these immersive media adaptive um, technology applications that the foundation, nobody likes to talk about it. It's not very sexy, right? Like it's not, you know, <laughs> like how your data is structured is important then people's eyes glaze over right but it is incredibly important to have clear consistent and comprehensive data that comes through across the system human readable ready for consumption consumption by analysts and consumption by an adaptive system um well, and, and that foundational piece is missing in an amazing amount of, of companies and i won't 
specifically say who, but it's 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 a huge problem. Um, yeah. Mostly because these companies, it's so interesting. And that's one reason I'm building Thrival Interactive, which is um, this emergent game company that's AI driven and changing the face of personalization um, because we're solving data problems from, from the foundation up. So for example, uh, major tech companies are usually built based on legacy infrastructure where you have, you know, BI over here and you have user testing over here and then you have marketing data over here and then you have, you know, maybe some event stream data coming in over here and then none of the systems talk to each other and it's built on this bureaucratic legacy and <laughs> trying to change that after after all of the bureaucratic structures and political structures of the company are built on that is like trying to change the foundation of a skyscraper after it's built. Like yeah, you just can't, it's, it's extremely difficult. So a lot of my work has been, Hey, how does your basic data infrastructure look? Are you getting really clear data that talks to other sources of data? Are you getting clean data that, that effectively runs your adaptive system, that and a culture of data. So at Age of Learning, um, one thing we really did as product owner that I, I really helped work on with this amazing team of, of, of people building these games is data as production culture, not an afterthought, not like a thing we plug in later and, you know, it's so whatever, we'll just think about that later. No, it's integrated from the beginning in terms of evidence-driven design, um, the event stream data that's coming through uh, that the well, designers know, that, right? I think I think you described the importance of it really yes. clearly. And what, what changes is with the advent of AI, we're able to, to take that data yeah. and uh, and utilize it in real time. And, yeah. and I would suggest that that didn't exist before. Yes. But in your experience, what challenges and opportunities yeah. come up when applying AI to you know, to support deep dynamic immersion in various, you know, digital experiences. Mm -hmm. So I think one of them is, you know, what I just described as data infrastructure, <laughs> what data is coming in and how, um, and that, that is a really important, you know, sort of bridge that needs vertical integration with design, with production and with data integrity practices to feed whatever uh, intelligent adaptive engine you have going on. So that's one, I think also there are ethical considerations um, as always with the use of data, with the security of data. Um, and, you know, you see a lot of issues now with Gen AI and uh, copyrighted material, right? So I think these things are gonna be ongoing and- um, It's one of the, what a massive field of growth is IP protection yes. and, and all of that because they're gonna have to start from scratch. I mean, they're, they're gonna, yes. certainly they're gonna be writing it over the old laws that have existed for a very long, very long time. Mm -hmm. But there's an argument to say, you gotta start all over again. This is just a whole different application. Yeah, yeah. And I just saw that um, SAG signed a contract with an AI company um, approving uh, the replication of voice actors, um, you know, voices for use in games and it's the, the the voice actors are not happy about this agreement and I think you're going to see a lot of um people trying to protect their IP trying to protect their their you know very real uh personal uh contribution as artists and I and I think it's important to strike that balance I mean I mean, some, mm -hmm. I said there's lots of players involved in that right yeah. from the studios to the voice actors and yes. and you know, one nuance of change. Does that mean it's not them anymore? I mean, you know. Exactly. I mean, as a former actor and voice actor, and, and I have a voice acting credit in the game we did in, at my first yeah. game studio. In, That's uh, when I get back to the combination of blockchain slash crypto slash AI, mm. because if, if micropayments can be given, no one mm. has to do the accounting, right? right? It's all done over the blockchain and trackable. Mm -hmm. There, it's, you know, yep. you... you your services become recognized mm -hmm. in real time mm -hmm. and you collect the value on those. But that's yeah. A, yeah. That, that's a combination yeah. of, uh, of all these technologies coming together. Yeah. But how, how does one make AI drive gaming and entertainment, make it even more immersive in the future? What, what do you see with that? So I see a huge opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's another reason I established Thrival Interactive, which is a, a corporation um, now, it's official. Um, and we're going through a seed. Thank you. It's a, we're going through a seed round of funding currently to support um, AI driven uh, game creation and tools that revolutionizes engagement with AI 
um, including building in hard to measure constructs uh, detection in real time, having that feed the AI engine and then respond to players, as well as with inclusive design leadership. So I think this personalization is a huge opportunity to widen the user base across a lot of different kinds of gamers. So right now, you know, I think, you know, for example, um, women are 50% of gamers. Literally, we're half of gamers. I personally am a hardcore gamer. <laughs> I try I my best. A lot of people don't realize that, but it's a no. fact. No, and, it, and it's really true. And, and they're one of the, the fastest rising RPG market sectors. Um, and yet, many of the AAA titles are focused on sort of a more traditional 18 to 35 year old sort of male audience. Um, and that's okay, like that's worked. Um, but I think we're in an era where we can use personalization um, and AI to broaden, just to broaden the user base, to drop some of the barriers of engagement and while retaining the amazing engagement of these, uh, these games. And I think AI is a really um, great opportunity to do that. I think, you know, through, through some basic design tweaks and AI integrated play, I think we can really open up, um, you know, the user base across a lot of different folks. So let's um, get, let's jump beyond learning and entertainment a little bit. Okay. If you had a crystal ball and you, you were looking into it right now, uh, the advancements in digital immersion that can impact our daily lives, um, how are they going to transform how we engage with, mm. with the world around us, so to speak? Any thoughts on that? That's so interesting. So that's a great question. I, I had done um, a little bit of work with DARPA. I, I, again, I can't probably say much, but it was around situation awareness, um, which is a huge theme for military um, success. And one thing that keeps emerging in the literature there is that um, automation decreases situation awareness. It just does. When something is automated and you don't have to pay attention to it, uh, your situation awareness and performance goes way down. Uh, on the other hand, the reverse situation, if you have to manually uh, be engaged in doing something um, and, and let's say flight, the more manually engaged you are in the flight of a, of a craft, the more you're likely to pay attention to everything that's going on around you. Now, some levels of automation aren't bad, but once you get to a certain point, you stop, you stop being aware, you stop sort of engaging and even knowing how to fly the plane, what if the, you know, automated system goes down. So I think, one thing it's going to impact for us is that we have to strike a balance between using things like generative AI to write for us, to do everything for us, versus us losing, you know, losing the ability to write by ourselves, right? So it's sort of like we need to still maintain our, the ability to generate ideas, the ability to express and write and even generate art. Right. But, I, I am still stuck on that statement. Automation decreases situational yes. awareness. I mean, it is, it is more than accurate. Nobody would argue with that. And our worlds are getting more and more and more automated. So I think there, yes. there does in lie the dance, right? Yes. How do we embrace technology, be very excited for what can and will do, and at yeah. the same time, protect things like that? It's, it's really, really big. Because if we look long into the future, you know, I'm also concerned about the socioeconomic impact of this learning approach as opposed to standard classroom type setting, right? That mm -hmm. most of us experience. As we go closer to the AI replicating this generation's teachers, what changes can we expect to see in the next decade or so? Um, I mean, much like our, like how AI is gonna, you know, force us to reevaluate the balance between generating things ourselves and relying on tools to do it. Um, I think it's also similar in the in the education environment. So I've always seen AI as a complement to human-based instruction. Um, now, it doesn't mean that there can't be automated instruction. Cognitive tutors have been around for a long time to do just that. But there is, um, and this is coming from 20 years in education, um, being, a, being a teacher myself for, for at least 12 years, um, and in another life, it seems like a long time ago, but um, I don't think anything is going to replace an interpersonal element of teaching, especially for the younger grades, you know, K through 12 education. I, you know, people respond <laughs> to people. Um, and, and sometimes that's not always a boon, right? Like everyone's had that teacher that they didn't get along with. 
right? Yeah. But the, the reality is that really influences our education and most of the time um, in a positive way, uh, one hopes. And so I don't think that um, AI is going to replace people entirely. I think it's best to use as a complement. Um, so as a teacher, for example, and wow, when was it? 2005. Um, I desperately wished I had a teacher aide. Well, our school, you know, it, it was a charter school I'd helped to found as a founding teacher and administrator at the charter school, which is still standing today in LA. Congratulations. Um, thanks. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I desperately wish I had a teacher aide. And of course there was no affording that. We were in, we were a title one school um, serving 95% free and reduced lunch kids, 75% English language learners. There wasn't budget for that. However, looking back, I wish, and I had, I would bring computers into the classroom and have kids use them, like my own personal computers that were kind of, you know, I, I, I tried to get students engaged in that as much as possible because I believed in the potential for digital interaction and personalization even then. So I think, um, I think that when used uh, in concert with with human teaching, it, it can be an incredibly powerful tool. That's like a personalized tutor. Um, sitting with you, working through your stuff. I you mean, know, it's, I, it's a, it, it creates a such a, a larger balance of opportunity because yeah, yes, you know, we've all we've all seen it in in yes. um, in areas where they're more affluent. Yes, they do spend a lot of money for tutors on their kids. They're personalized mm -hmm. tutors, and they yes. learn. And quite honestly, it works very very well. And what yeah. what we're saying is, with this automation, yes, sort of everybody can can get that right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, that's a really big statement. It's, I think it's super advantageous to our whole culture. I, I hope so. I mean, that's what that's what drove me into grad school is I just thought like this is kind of broken and I want to change it from the outside in because I think there's an opportunity to have assessment and, and formative assessment, meaning ongoing information about learning process that can be used to help students in real time. And, and we're not taking advantage of this right now. And I felt like the assessment system was really broken. What you said is exactly why I went to grad school, was like, we need to leverage simulations and games to understand learning process and support students in real time. And that can change, that can level the playing field, you know, and, and help, yeah. help, you know, um, tighten the achievement gap because, you know, God knows that early standardized testing was widening it. Um, and our students who need it the most deserve better. So let's, um, so, I mean, you're describing that project, which is pretty fantastic, but let's take it down to present day. What other projects are tackling uh, during this exciting time right now, right now, and what's next for you, for you in the AI journey? I'm really excited about the opportunities for AI in personalization. Um, in particular, I'm working with a few clients on that through my consultancy, Learning Data Discovery. You know, our, our model is producing AI-driven games um, that do, optimize engagement and have personalization beyond what has been seen before, um, while also supporting a broad user base uh, and, and a lot of different players, uh, you know, incorporated into into a play a play experience that's that's good for a lot of different people. Um, well, and I we think know, yeah. we, we know how big the gaming industry is as an industry, and secondarily, we know the impact that gaming is having yes. on. Uh, on you know this generation, the last generation, and more so as the generations are going on. So that's really important work, and it sounds pretty Thank fantastic. You. We're, we're going to now head into the next segment, which is AI wants to know. So AI is curious, just as we are. These are ten quick questions. They're designed to uncover the intriguing human mysteries that AI longs to comprehend, but they can't quite grasp. Uh, snack. It's a snack break in our journey, so keep the answers quick. But the safety belt sign it's also off so if it feels right we can occasionally roam about the cabin exploring more of who you are and what makes you fit um you ready for this i'm ready all right question number one what's the first thing you ever remember being proud of um my huge lincoln logs cabin that i built so <laughs> i'm i'm dating myself but lincoln logs were like the legos of the 1980s and i That's would fantastic. build to well, so yeah. it was from building things, even back then. So yes, that was just, creating and building things, yeah. Yep. So what do you need help with that you wish you mm. did not? Balancing all the things. I have an enormous appetite for pie, <laughs> at least sticking my fingers into too many of them at once, um, and tools and people to help do that are essential. All right. And what are others 
uh, often look to you for help with? Um, compassionate leadership, uh, vision, new ideas, and the technical ability to implement them. I get a lot of compassion and empathy from you during the course of this interview, so Thank I think you. Uh, you probably you probably nailed it. Um, what what do you treasure most about your human abilities? I think the ephemeral human experience makes it invaluable. If you think about scarcity, it makes things precious. And having the opportunity to cherish that and be present from moment to moment with the beauty of things is a gift. It also creates wonderful opportunities for innovation, right? Yep. So it's, uh, I, I, you know, we fight against change and yet change is what makes every moment of our lives precious. Take a deep breath. If you don't have some butterflies in your stomach, you need to go take on a bigger <laughs> challenge. So, <laughs> so throughout your whole life, what is the most consistent thing about you? I would say heart and creativity. Um, I try really hard to do the right thing, even though I don't always succeed. Um, I think ethical, compassionate leadership is deeply important. Um, and we can push boundaries and, and have innovation while still not losing our humanity. So that's your consistency now throughout your whole life. What has changed the most? Mm. Trust in my intuition. So I trust my gut a lot more than I did, you know, 10 years ago. And it's never failed me. Uh, that's my sound strange coming from a data scientist, um, but it's true. Um, my relationship with failure has also changed. You know, we talked about detecting productive failure in real time. Um, as I've moved forward as an entrepreneur, my grit has grown a lot. So I think it's really easy to see your worth in terms of what other people think. But being an entrepreneur, part of that is, is a series of failures that teach you and you learn from and then you move forward, right? Um, if you only are accustomed to success, that's very brittle. Uh, it breaks. Um, and, then, and then what do you have? You have a devastated worldview. So I think my relationship with failing forward has grown a lot and in a positive way with a lot of grit. Uh, those are those are really a great little list there of what what changed the most because that's just called growth maturity. So I love it. Um, yes. What do you find the strangest about reality? <laughs> that reality is so surreal. <laughs> All right, we'll leave that one right there. That's great. When most recently do you remember feeling alive? That feeling we've all had from time to time. It just comes up. Creating a vision for the future of games. I'm really, I love games. If you can't tell, I'm completely obsessed with them. And I think creating a vision for the future of inclusive games based in groundbreaking AI and, and unbelievable personalization that we've never seen before is really exciting. And so building that deck and, and connecting with my current funders has been incredible. Fantastic. And with that, what is your most unique trait? Combination of creativity and analytical trait. So like cre creativity and analytics, I guess, the combination of those, which most people see those as opposites, but they integrate here. <laughs> yeah, and often we see them out of two different people, right? So mm. that's very fascinating. So if you weren't human, what would you be? I would be a leafy sea dragon with humanoid intelligence. Have you seen those things? They're unbelievable. They look like floating pieces of seaweed and yet they're like a work of art. And then I, but of course I would be, yeah, I would be supremely intelligent. So I would be fall victim to normal leafy sea dragon things. All right, we're gonna throw you a bonus question. So what's that one classroom experience that you had growing up that you wished you had AI to help you with? Hmm. I would say early math. So um, I grew up thinking I wasn't good at math, which is ironic, right? Considering yeah. that I'm now a data scientist and a PhD. But I think there's a lot of truth to the fact that, you know, girls were not terribly empowered in STEM in the 80s and uh, 70s. I think that's really true. I think a lot of initiatives has changed that and it's, it's for the positive. Um, but I do wish there had been game-based learning um, and AI game-based learning, because I would have eaten that up. I was already a gamer at age, what, seven, playing Gar Carmen Sandiego on the Commodore 64. 
So I would have just devoured that and loved it and become great at math. I mean, I was a kid who was like, the teacher was like, memorize these math facts. And my question was like, why? <laughs> why, why are you telling me to do this? There's no reason for me to do this. There's no motivating context. So I guess early math. All right. Well, that's a good one. We're going to head to the next segment and it's AI leaders and influencers, right? So it allows you to highlight some of the leading individuals, projects, and organizations that influenced you. Uh, can you tell us about some leaders that you noticed in the world of AI? Yeah. Um, so I've had the... I've had the opportunity to work with We Global Studios. I'm a tech advisor uh, on their tech board. And there's this wonderful woman named um, Fernanda. Um, she is the founder of We Global Studios, which is a women's organization supporting entrepreneurs. And um, she's incredible. She has a she has an AI based company as well. Um, she has been a deep inspiration to me. Um, and I'm really grateful to her for supporting this journey. Uh, I don't think I would be here without her. Um, someone else, I, I, you know, I think Chris Cheney is another person um, who he's a he's a VC founder. Um, he's a, he's a VC funder and a founder himself. Um, I worked closely with him over the last few years, and he has a real um, head for AI and tech and how that applies in gaming to support profitable and ethical ventures. Um, so. AILA is another organization here in, in LA um, that I've worked with a few times and I thank them deeply for the opportunities they've given. Um, and lastly, with roots in graduate school, um, International Educational Data Mining Society. When I was at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, which believe it or not is a top institution. <laughs> I say that everyone's like, I don't know, is that a community college? Like I, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a well-regarded place with good people. And I managed to, um, work with Ryan Baker and, and run into Ryan Baker a lot. Who's, uh, who tenured at, um, UPenn now, and he really helped found the field of educational data mining. And he has been an incredible support and influence this whole time. So I want to give a shout out to the data, international educational data mining society and Ryan Baker. Fantastic. Is there anybody that you want to give a shout out to that we haven't mentioned and share their Twitter handle or anything else for our listeners? Um, I don't have Twitter handles. I, I do want to thank um, Sunil um, Gundaria, who is a, a, a mentor and um, at Age of Learning for a long time and has been incredibly supportive. Um, and my colleague, KP Tai, who is wonderful and and um, she's she's a great learning engineer and is doing really exciting work at Apple right now. So they've both been, I've worked with them a long time and um, they've been incredibly supportive and inspiring. So thank you guys. All right, great. Well, this is where we're, we're on to the next segment now with, uh, with resources. So it's where we share a handful of your uh, favorite resources in AI. Um, I believe that you've prepared a few ideas. If you can mm -hmm. tell us about them, that'd be great. Yeah, so I, this is a fairly sort of technical list, I guess. Um, I have experience in like, you know, in, in Snowflake and Databricks um, in terms of sort of like, uh, you know, analytics environments. But um, some of my favorite resources, especially for learning things that I'm always sort of tinkering with 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 new code and new visualizations and more complex uh, <laughs> writing, more complex algorithms and things. And so Data Camp is um, a, a place I really like to learn with um i I've, I've had an account with them for a long time and they're great for just going in and tinkering with stuff and um their console based learning is good i've i use r studio uh it's it's i guess fairly standard now and and maybe not super cutting edge but it's you know it's it's a good old tool for anybody that doesn't know it's the letter r and then the word studio yeah um weka is a really great experimental tool w e k a um and it started as a teaching tool for, you know, it's kind of educational data mining stuff, but it's, it's a great piece of software for sort of experimenting with machine learning uh, in particular. Um, and it's, 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 it's a great teaching tool and a great experimenting tool. There's no code required. So Weka is great for sort of dabbling in things. Sometimes I still go to Weka if I want just like a quick and dirty uh, visualization of something or like to, to just throw some data at the wall, see what sticks. Um, sometimes I do that with Weka still, um, in terms of 
generative AI, um, you know, I'm enjoying Bard. I've, I've used um, Chat GPT, of course. Dream Studio is one that I've also used recently. And no, I'm not getting sponsored by any of these. These are all just me off the top of my head saying There's what I've real used. value, yeah. Yeah. Um, Dream Studio by Stability AI has been really cool to use. Um, the most sort of accessible one that's not tied to another piece of software like i think you know there's one that you have to have um, discord to use and you know and that one's actually had some legal problems recently i think anyway dream studio is nice and accessible it does have a lot of customization options for creating ai art so if you're not comfortable with customization don't use it but i like it um well, those are those are yeah. i mean those are super great because for our listeners they want to you know, learn, dabble, play with, and you just give a, a great list of some uh, um, places they can go to, to, you know, up their learning skills here a little bit. Is there anything you can suggest as a tip, sort of, I don't know, a cool way that you use AI and that we haven't talked about, just to quickly leave our listeners with the, with, with a little, uh, I'll call it um, a little icing on the cake. I can think of two ways that I've used generative AI that has been life-saving. So first of all is uh, using AI art um, to create customized graphics for slides, um, which like, I, you know, if we've all, anybody that's done a deck is like, oh my God, I can't find that one piece of art as free clip art on the internet. Like, what am I going to do? <laughs> It's, a, it's really great to just be like, I need this specific thing. And then it makes it for you. And it's fantastic. Um, the other thing, I mean, it's not really revolutionary, but um, I know you can't possibly tell this by how verbose I've been on this uh, <laughs> this show. But we'll call it informative because it's been very informative. Thank you. Thank you. But I, yeah. I tend to be verbose. I tend to just to write a lot, to say a lot. So my slides, um, the first draft is always a wall of text. So what I do is I like to put that into chat GPT or Bard and just say, condense this. <laughs> and it like takes it down to a third of the yeah. size and it's great. Life-saving. Super helpful. Yeah. Suggestion, proofread after it happens. Don't just send it out to someone. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. 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 So where, where can listeners go to learn more about you and the projects that you're working on, your, your new company, et cetera? Thanks. So right now my LinkedIn uh, profile is the main source of, um, information about me. Uh, I, let's see, it's V dot Elizabeth, the Elizabeth Owen at LinkedIn. Um, or you can just look me up Elizabeth Owen comma PhD on LinkedIn. That's me. Uh, so that's, that's the main kind of, yeah. Site that right. I have. Dr. Elizabeth Owen, what a pleasure, right? My gosh, you, you're at the, the tip of the spear and all that's going on. And we thank you so much for taking your time to to appear here and i'm sure our listeners are going to absolutely love it and with Thank that so it's time for another safe landing at the outer edges of the ai universe for today this is your captain ron and on behalf of our guests and the entire crew i'd like to thank you for choosing to voyage with us today we wish you a safe and uh, enjoyable continuation of your journey when you come back aboard make sure to bring a friend our starship is always ready for more adventures head on over to spotify or itunes right now rate us share your thoughts uh, your support and feedback need the world to us. Don't forget to visit edgeofai.xyz. Uh, edge you can learn more about partnering and subscribe to the Outer Edge newsletter for the latest Edge of Company news, events, and show drops. In addition, connect with us on all major social platforms by searching for Edge of underscore AI and join the exciting conversations that are happening online. Before we sign off, mark your calendars for our next voyage where we'll continue unraveling AI's mysteries and advancements. Until then, bye-bye. The views and opinions expressed on Edge of AI reflect solely those views and opinions of the show hosts and its guests. Please make sure to do your own research. While we make every effort to ensure that the information about AI technology is accurate and up-to-date, we cannot guarantee its accuracy, completeness, or timeliness. We make no representations or warranties of any kind with respect to the information, products, or services discussed. Please be aware AI may occasionally generate incorrect or misleading information and produce offensive or biased content. Under no circumstances shall we be liable for any loss or damage, including without limitation, indirect or consequential loss or damage, or any loss or damage arising from loss of data or profits arising out of or in connection with the use of technology discussed on our podcast.
Additionally, our show is not financial advice. You understand that you are using any and all information available on or through this podcast at your own risk. Whenever making financial decisions, we recommend doing your own research and talking to your accountant for financial advice. Lastly, time to time, we may feature sponsored content on the show for which we receive value, and we may share links for which we receive a commission if you make a purchase through one of these links. Refer to our website, edgeofai.xyz, for our full disclaimer, terms and conditions, privacy policy, and copyright notice.